Crab's journal, end. I signed myself out a few days later. Once I was sure the pneumonia had cleared up and went home, I had nowhere else to go. Besides, I didn't like the way I left things with my parents. We all sort of coexisted in a tense atmosphere for a few weeks. After all, there was quite a few taboos between us, a lot of old shadows from the past to dodge. But they really tried, and because they did, I did. One thing that was hard to get used to was living with sleeping in a building. It almost drove me nuts. I felt so closed and all the time. After months of living outside with no walls between your skin and the horizon, a ceiling a few feet from your head takes getting used to. I spent long hours lying on my bed in the weak winter sunshine, reliving those work-filled days of summer and early fall. It's strange how the tang of wood smoke hanging in the air or the glint of sunlight or wa- on waves can glide into your mind almost as real as the real thing. I had some bad moments, too. Remembering Mary, with no one to share these sadness, I owed her a lot. Not only my life, but the way she, I was trying to live it. And I knew that, in a way, she was part of myself. And she would be long after I stopped remembering her. My mother brought me into this world, but Mary got me ready to live in it. Don't think I spent that whole winter moping around, though. Not in your life. After a month or so of doing nothing, the inactivity was starting to get to me. So I took up jogging to get some exercise and stay in shape. I also answered an ad in the newspaper and got a job at a sheet metal plant across town that manufactures office equipment, shelves, and certain auto body parts. It's a small factory. The interview for the job was interesting. The foreman, a muscular middle-aged guy named Brighton, had a blown-up photo framed on his desk of a canoeist shooting whitewater rapids. He was the canoeist. Before our interview really got rolling, I asked him about the picture, and we got talking about canoe trips and camping. Brighton job shares with another man who skis, so each can take a few months off work during the season he likes. I think I got the job because of the photos. I sweep floors, mop up the cafeteria, clean the washroom, fascinating stuff like that. My parents aren't too happy about Crab, the scholar doing unskilled labor, but I wanted money for clothes and so on. I also wanted to pay them something for room and board. It's not a thrilling job, but the money's good, so it'll do for now. As soon as spring chased the snow away, I put a pack together and hitchhiked up to the Ithaca Camp neighborhood. It took a new battery that I brought in a little one-horse town up there and a lot of coaxing and some swearing, but I got the station wagon going. You know the one I hid in the bush? It coughed and sputtered at first, and it sort of waddled into town on almost flat tires, but soon it was purring along. I pumped up the tires, filled the gas tank, and drove around for a while. Ithaca Camp was a buzz of activity, so I stayed away from there. But I did take a walk along the route I had to travel in the snowstorm. I wanted to find the pack and canoe I'd abandoned, but both were gone. It was a nice day, so I pushed through to the lake at the beginning of the portage and spent the night there for old time's sake. Next day, I headed back to the city. When I rolled into our driveway, my parents almost croaked. They had been pretty good about badgering me with questions about where I'd run off to last spring, but when I turned up with the car, it was too much for them. That night at the dinner table, I noticed something strange. My father removed that silly brass candelabra, so I took it as a favorable omen and gave my parents a heavily edited version of what I've been written in, what I've written in this journal. They weren't completely satisfied with what I told them because they knew I was leaving out a lot, and they asked me quite a few questions that I glossed over or avoided altogether. And there was still some bitterness, theirs and mine, cooking away under the surface of our com- conversation. But nobody was lecturing anybody, and for the first time I was able to talk to them without the feeling that someone else had written out our lines for us. Not long after that, an interesting thing happened at work. I started jogging at my lunch hours and discovered that Brighton, the foreman, and I have something else in common, running for fitness. He does it to keep in shape for canoeing. So on days when he isn't too busy in the office, we run together. You'd expect a guy like Brighton to be super macho, but he isn't. He's actually a very gentle person. One day, as we slogged through the grimy streets near the plant, he told me about an outfit he and his wife run in the summer. It's called Project Adventure, and it's connected with Family Court. He and his wife take kids who have been in trouble with the law and would ordinarily go to some kind of reform school on wilderness canoe trips for two or three weeks at a time. The idea is to get them away from bad influences, and more important, help them grow some self-respect and cooperation with other people what the psychologists call social skills, he said. I asked him if I could come along on one of those trips. 
I was dying to get back into the bush, and I thought I'd like to work at something like that, where you do something good, or, or at least try to. Brighton says these kids don't like themselves too much. Maybe I could do for someone what Mary did for me, on a smaller scale, of course. So in a couple of weeks, I'm going on a canoe trip with the Brighton, and they're going to test me out and see if I can handle myself outdoors. I'm pretty sure I can satisfy them. Uh.